we're looking at the project we're going to make today in six or seven steps. There's also a pattern on my website that has detailed instructions that are color coded for the different things that we're going to do. But just so that you're oriented to what we're doing, because this is an advanced project with a lot of complicated steps, we are going to be joining the spine of the mitt first and then we are and so it'll be like that the pinky side of the mitt will be joined first and then we are going to do this binding that comes across the top and do this decorative raw edge binding treatment and then we're going to fold the piece wrong sides together and shape the thumb and the finger area we'll turn it and then we'll add this little hanger when I first started making these, this was my pattern. I used this small size back when I used to stitch all the way around. I went to a little bit larger uh, pattern when I just started quilting them without doing that and then I kind of outlined the outside as I go. Because this pattern has an irregular shape, you'll want to devise a cutting strategy that wastes as little of your time and materials as possible. If you fold your material and cut through it at once, you'll waste a little bit versus if you lay the pieces out cookie cutter style so that you waste as little as possible. And you'll just have to decide based on whether you've purchased new materials, whether you have scraps, whatever works best so you can assemble all the pieces that you need. This is my top fabric. front and back and then a layer of these aren't matched up the best and then a layer of cotton batting and then a layer of insulin bright and then another cotton batting and then what's going to be my inside liner and I gotta say this is hard on your machine there are some parts of this that are very difficult it is the most uh, strain on my machine of anything that I do, at least that I can think of right now. Maybe sewing through uh, overlapping denim seams is, is just as bad or, or even worse. You might not want to actually make these, but you might learn a few things from seeing how I do it. It might be of interest. And if you have a real stout machine, you might want to go ahead and try it. So anyway, I, I don't plan to keep making oven mitts. I've, I've made enough but I'm going to show you how I do it in case there's anything with the process of what I'm doing that is helpful to you in your endeavors. So that's going to be the back of my piece. These are going to match these with these curly cues. The shape of my business is changing. Not only am I trying to do more online, even though uh, I abandoned those efforts with the shopping cart that I used to have on my website, and I've always resisted doing commissions and special orders, I'm finding right now that some of my bigger Christmas shows have gotten to the point that they're not really going to continue anymore, and which is fine. I can find other things to do, and I do want to stop making some of these smaller pieces. But I think it's important if you make things to always think in terms of retooling. If you make widgets and the world stops needing widgets, uh, you go out of business. If you consider yourself to be someone who meets the needs of people, then it's easier to think in terms of how do I shift now that the world is changing. Okay, so I'm ready to start stitching this together. It's all quilted. I have the six layers of batting, three on each one. I think the Warm Company actually recommends that you do one of each, the Inselbright and the cotton batting, but I tend to overbuild things. I've got right sides together, and what I'm going to do is show you with chalk. I wouldn't normally mark this. I would just stitch it but I'm going to back stitch in this area here. I'm not going to go too near the edge because I don't want the back of my foot to go off. I don't want to have to prop that up. 
you know, you could prop your foot up with something like this or even with some thicknesses of cardboard. You know, this one's adjustable and it's made by the sewing machine company. But if you can avoid doing this by planning ahead, then you don't have to mess with any of that, which can slow you down and you can still get a good stitch. And so I'm going to stitch back and forth there uh, a lot. And then I'm going to sew down here kind of straight and then I'm going to angle out. And that's going to match the way your hand curves when you grab and you've got your finger going outward. So that's why I'm doing that and I'm starting up at this top. Okay, so you can see how I'm not letting my foot get too far off the back. And this is stitched across here anyway, so this is really the live area of the piece. I'm not planning to use anything outside of this stitching. Something else. Okay, so. You need a big needle for this. I've used everything from a 14 to an 18. I tend to like it more uh, a 16, but I don't have any of those right now. When you trim these, you don't want to get too close. You need to leave enough that you're, if you're really close, less than an eighth, you really are in danger of that ripping out. There are a lot of layers here. I think 3 16th is more uh, in the safe zone. So we're going to trim down this. And then we're just going to trim off the edge. So this is the back side of our mitt and I've used a taupe thread. Now the top of my mitt is going to bow here and what I'll do is I'll do like a dashed line to show you where the stitching ends up and where I think that you cut it later. But I will start with the big pattern and I'll maybe I'll color code the different lines so that you can see that. These are supposed to be freeform and artistic, and then we want to cut across this top, and then I don't, uh, I don't go straight, because I like them to be not too uniform. I do like them to look very neat. I like them to be very well made, but it's not important to me that the lines be straight. In fact, I rather like when they have some variation. This is going to have a raw edge at the top, and when we do raw edges, it's important to use a batik fabric because that will keep things from fraying too much and ripping out. I didn't bother to back stitch that because I'm just going to be sewing through that edge. Again, we're going to trim this and we're going to go certainly between an eighth and three sixteenths. Do not skimp on this edge. Do not go down to a sixteenth. And actually, I, I always try to remember to trim from the back so that I can really see how far I am. And, you know, if you're trimming like this perfectly, that's good. But if you must angle, angle this way so that your back part is going to be longer and right here, where you're actually eyeballing what you're doing, you can keep that a nice, consistent 8th to 3 sixteenths, so that it will not rip out in the laundry. And this can be, you know, you wouldn't want to go a quarter. A quarter would be too much. Okay, so I've got this now. And I'm just going to turn this to the front. Hope you can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to blast this with my iron. So we do like that. Again, I never draw this. 
I just do it, but I'm going to show you so that you have an idea of what I'm after. We need to close this top in a way that's artistic and not likely to ravel out a whole bunch. So we don't want a straight line that goes with the grain. We need some variation. Just like with a pinking shears, only much bigger and uh, more attractive than that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stitch up here and then I'm going to come back and then I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to come through here. And I've got to go over this lump here. But then I'm going to come up here, do the same type of a thing, come off this edge. And if you know me, you'll know that this is what the stitching looks like on all of my oven mitts. I've done some other things. But this is the one that's sort of tried and true. It's fast, it's attractive, it wears well, and so 99% of the oven mitts I make have this type of stitching. I like to put a little wiggle in the line sometimes, and so you'll see how much I do that on this one, or don't. I'm going to trim this. I'm not going to get too close. Again, that it needs to hold up through the laundry. And I'm going to wash this before it goes to the consumer. And after it gets washed and dried, I will uh, trim off the ratty part that will be on this edge, sort of like when you make cutoffs and you wash them for the first time. Now I'm going to use this scrap to make my little hanging loop and I'm going to press it at the iron. I'm not going to show that but I will show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to flip it and it doesn't matter to me since it's going to be covered up that this edge here is frayed like this but if it did I could cut that straight and then I'm going to do it again and I'm just going to press this like this so that it's folded two times. So all I'm going to do with this is stitch in a wavy, sort of like if you were drawing a fish. None of this has to be super precise. Sometimes I'll match it up so that there are three of these little shapes. And then I just use, hopefully not my best pair of scissors, I always have a bunch of them that have been used a lot, and I just kind of do a scalloped edge where I'm cutting off a scallop so that again this edge isn't so straight that it just keeps fraying down and fraying down and has a you know a fringe on the edge. Some of it is going to pull off and it will be a little bit frayed looking which is fine. We're going to shape this and what I tend to do is I, I go on this side first and I come around and I do always draw it. I either draw it with chalk or with a washable marker. It's going to be on the inside of the knit, but it's still nice to use something that's going to wash out of there. And I like to make these, you know, pretty good size. They shrink up a little bit in the wash and they, they seem smaller once they're turned because of all those layers. And so I think we want to be right about here. Again, I will do my best to indicate on the pattern what this really ends up shaped like. I'm kind of thinking no one will actually make these, but I do hope that there's something here that is helpful to something you've been thinking about doing. I just think it's a little crazy to make these. Okay, so we want to get a nice thumb and then we tend to kind of bow this way through here and then I like to have a nice curve back to kind of where we started. So you can see what I'm going for there. 
Uh, I hope you can see it. Um, this is the hardest part. I'm trying to match up these ends right here because it wouldn't look good if they were like this sewn together. You really need them pretty close for it to look right. Now, I've tried to strategically design this so that when I'm going forward and back, I'm not going all the way off. But if I really were, I would go ahead and use this little guy for two or three thicknesses to support the back of my foot. Instead what I try to do is keep close enough to this part here that I'm not really going off the back. Let's see how it works. Sometimes I do walk this by hand to get right up to that edge. I'm leaning off the back. And this is where you want to be careful. If I just hit the gas right now, my needle would break and pieces would fly around and into my machine. So I'm going to walk this forward. Get back up on this smooth part. Now this can be hard on your thread going through all this. That's why that big needle helps you not have so much shredding going on because it's really making a big enough hole for that thread. All of those layers, all of that fiber pressing on that thread can really shred it up and make it break a lot on you. I'm using a little stitch here. I want this nice and tight. I am going to double stitch one area. The rest is all going to be just one layer. How far to make your, now I always take my foot off the pedal when I reach up to the machine and I don't normally reach up to the machine right now, but I'm still taking my foot off. You don't want to make this too long. These are functional and people do use them. Sometimes I make them so big down here that they're really better for uh, displaying, but as you know, hands come in all shapes and sizes and so I just make all shapes and sizes, you know, of hands that could actually exist and then trust that they'll end up with the person that will love them. And then I'm going to do one or two stitches depending on how small it is. And then I tend to kind of curve around this way, just a little gentle curve and you'll see that I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to swing around and I'm going to go up and meet up with my stitching over here. Before I do that, I'm just going to sew right back here, and I'm going to get on top of my stitching. I did two before, so I'm going to do two tiny little stitches again. At least one. Two if they're tiny like this. So before I cut these, I like to slide my hand in there, get a sense of, oh yeah, I'm going to like that. So I'm going to trim this out the same way that I've been saying, not too short, not under an eighth. If I put these through the wash and I always try to check carefully all along the edges, and if I see that I've trimmed one too short, I restitch that area immediately, going a little bit in, at least a sixteenth, depending on what I think I need, maybe an eighth in. So I try never to make them too, too tiny, because then you've got no room for repair as you go. And what I've really tried to do is just not trim them too close. You can see this is not super close. It is past an eighth. 
it really is about 3 16 and if you do this stuff all the time you get used to that This is the part that I really don't want to do any more of these things is trimming through all these layers. I just, I think I want to save my hands for my old age. This is where I've done those two stitches across and I'm just going to get right up in there. I'm not going to go all the way to it. It's going to be enough to just get about an eighth away from that. Now I'm going to trim this. And like I say, I'm angling out, if I can, on this fabric. Uh, because if I go like this, I could end up cutting way too short on the bottom. So you try to make sure what's underneath is longer or the same as what you're doing. Okay. So we do have quite a bit of waste. Okay, I hope you can see what I'm doing. So, here is our mitt, and you can start turning this just by turning it. That's pretty easy to do. Okay, so now I've got this thumb that needs to be turned, and I'm just going to shove this in there, and then I'm going to take this and pull it, push it through, and then I just push it out. And this, by the way, is, I can use a littler stick, I, I never use that hole. I think he made this hole a little big, so I made a second one so it would be a little tighter. And he made this stick out of a dowel, and it is oak. This is pine, and this is from cone thread. I don't know what brand. It's uh, big enough for my thing to go through. And if it's small enough to go inside my thumb. So here's my mitt. I'm going to sew on that uh, little hanger for those with the same batch, but I'm just going to sew this on here and I'm going to just stitch it back and forth once and then back and forth twice and I'm going to trim off the threads and call that good. I've got to really force this open so that I can get on here. Again, I will mark it so that you can see where I do this if anybody is you know wants to really frustrate themselves by trying to make something once that someone else has made <laughs> I hope I haven't made this a thousand times I know it's I know it's well into the hundreds One of the things about this guide that's kind of annoying on this particular machine, it would be nice to not have this bar sticking out. I've been working around it for years. So this is this piece straight out of the dryer and I recommend that people don't over dry my oven mitts and pot holders because at the end that's when most of the shrinkage will occur but I dry them really well because I want it to be really truly pre-shrunk when it gets to the consumer and so I don't I don't like to take them out you know wet at all I like to really dry them and then I just press them trying to make them look like they did before they went through the wash and I think this is a handsome knit some of them I like better than others I think that's true of the things we make 
I'm going to do a light trim around along here. These really don't need very much. They just, because of the irregular shape, there's just not a lot to take off of there. The potholders can have a lot more in some of the edges. And so I do this. And then I have a little tag that I put on. And I hope you could see what I was doing. It's certainly not rocket science. Um, my husband hates it when I say that. I probably should have stopped saying it two decades ago. Um, there it is. It'll get a little tag that'll hang right there. 